Hello and welcome. My name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the president of the Danube Institute in Budapest. And I'm here to introduce a symposium we are holding on the changing face of the Middle East, alliances and misalliances. We have a distinguished cast of experts, diplomats and academics, to discuss the questions of the Middle East and where it's going. Um, we have two of my colleagues um, who will comment on their comments and I'm now going to ask one of them, um, the visiting fellow George Bogdan uh, here at the Institute to introduce the speakers and to commence the discussion. Good evening. Um, I'm delighted to be here with the Danube Institute for a panel entitled Alliances and Misalliances, the Changing Face of the Middle East. Um, this is an incredibly exciting time to be discussing the future of that region. Um, we're just about 100 days into the Biden administration. Um, we've had a rocky five years. Um, COVID is, is shaping world events. And this evening we have a, an incredibly distinguished panel of um, four um, uh, individuals who have an extensive background, academic, uh, intellectual, um, diplomatic, and historical in the Middle East. Um, to start us off, um, I think I'm going to ask Dr. Kvek, who is the Director General for the Middle East and North Africa at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's formerly the ambassador from Hungary to Egypt, as well as to Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, and Chad. Um, each of our presenters is going to have about a 10-minute um, presentation. They'll answer questions and have an exchange with others uh, who are seated next to them. So Dr. Kvek, please. Thank you very much for uh, the introductory remarks. We heard uh, about tremendous changes in the Middle East. Uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with this because what we have witnessed in this region in the last, I would say, couple of months, it is, I think, more than uh, what we have seen in the last uh, 30 years. Why I'm saying this? We have seen uh, the signing of the so-called Abraham Accords, meaning uh, rearranging or arranging uh, cooperation, normalizing relations between Israel and four Arab countries. So far, it started with uh, the United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain last uh, August, September. It continued with uh, Sudan in October. And uh, we've had Morocco as well uh, in uh, December last year. These uh, changes, these um, agreements would have been unthinkable uh, before and uh, I think uh, the US administration deserves our uh, thanks and appreciation to, uh, to hammer out these uh, agreements uh, for the region. They were actually badly needed because uh, I think the uh, MENA region have been in a, in a deep trouble since um, quite uh, many years. The biggest problem, I would say, is what, uh, what we call uh, the so-called uh, uh, Arab Spring, this uh, phenomenon what, what, which the, uh, the Arabs uh, call rather the Arab Nightmare, because uh, it caused uh, very uh, big difficulties uh, in the whole region. Uh, it caused uh, economic collapse, social unrest, uh, uh, extremism, and, uh, and terrorism uh, became uh, stronger. And uh, under such circumstances, it was very, very difficult uh, to see uh, an end uh, at the, uh, a light at the uh, end of the tunnel. The situation was uh, uh, exacerbated by uh, the uh, COVID, by the pandemic uh, situation. Negative uh, processes became even worse. And under such uh, circumstances, it was uh, really um, a ray of hope that uh, this normalization uh, process uh, started between uh, Israel and uh, the Arab, uh, some Arab states. And I'm pretty sure that in the near future, uh, we might see uh, other Arab countries also uh, joining the uh, Abraham uh, Accords. 
Why uh, is this uh, so important for us? I think uh, it gives an opportunity to uh, uh, increase political stability uh, in the region. Political stability is badly needed uh, also to boost economy, to boost uh, investments uh, in this area, which has uh, a very young, very dynamic uh, uh, population, uh, very fast uh, growing population. And uh, if uh, there is uh, no sufficient uh, economic growth, it can cause uh, uh, disasters. Just uh, last year, uh, the MENA region had uh, a negative, a minus uh, economic growth, close to, uh, to minus uh, two, which is, uh, which is a very bad uh, thing if you consider that the uh, growth rate of the population is one of the highest worldwide, close to 2% in the whole region. So it, uh, it shows that a, a negative economic growth with a, a, a demographic explosion is like a time bomb. So uh, I think uh, the Abraham Accords uh, gives the opportunity to increase uh, uh, economic cooperation, uh, to increase investments, uh, creating jobs, uh, and uh, strengthening uh, political stability. This last expect uh, is extremely important for us Europeans as well, because if there is no political stability, uh, we have to expect a further increase of uh, all the negative phenomena that we used to uh, witness in the last couple of years, meaning illegal migration towards the north, towards Europe, and uh, increase of uh, terrorism. I'm pretty sure that uh, the good example of the cooperation that started already between uh, these countries uh, and Israel will attract other uh, countries of the region as well to, uh, to boost uh, their cooperation to, uh, to make a reconciliation uh, with Israel and uh, to make the whole uh, region more stable. I think uh, it is very important uh, uh, to emphasize that uh, it, is a, it is an open-end process. We have so far uh, four Arab countries uh, that joined uh, this club, but uh, I think uh, the opportunities are open for, uh, for others as well, both from, from North Africa and uh, from the Gulf uh, region. I'm sure that uh, the uh, economic uh, aspect will be very attractive uh, for, uh, for other countries uh, um, in, the, uh, in the Arab world. And let me emphasize uh, a very important aspect why it is a must uh, to continue uh, with this past. And this is the, the energy aspect. In this region, uh, we have 48% uh, of the total reserves of petroleum worldwide and 38% of gas reserves. In the last couple of years, uh, tremendous uh, gas uh, fields were uh, identified in the Eastern Mediterranean. Without uh, making a reconciliation, a kind of cooperation, none of the countries of the region will be able to market and to explore the gas and to enjoy its uh, economic benefits. We have the uh, East Med gas pipeline uh, uh, incoming. We have the East Mediterranean Gas Forum uniting uh, Israel, uh, Egypt, uh, Greece, uh, other countries, which is, uh, which is uh, something uh, that would have been unthinkable a couple of years ago. So uh, I'm pretty convinced that, uh, that the energy aspect, uh, the East Med uh, gas uh, fields and the gas pipeline will be a catalyst for uh, reconciliation and for boosting cooperation in, uh, um, in this region. And I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing further progress to the benefit uh, of, the, of the MENA region and Europe and uh, for the whole world.
Thank you. Because we're hoping that the panel will be a, a bit conversational, I'd like to offer the opportunity for the other panelists to respond in brief um, before their other presentations. So I would like to reflect on two different topics. First of all, the actual challenges related to the MENA region. And secondly, later on during the discussion, also I would like to summarize my views on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and overcoming of this. So I try to determine first the most important and persistent challenges uh, to consider which can influence the current MENA political vacuum. Uh, I made a short list of, of eight points. The first being, I formalize like this, the decline of unipolarity. Uh, the results of the ongoing global transition from uh, USA unipolarity to a bipolar US-China, or maybe multipolar, including maybe Russia, uh, will include growing challenges to the existing international system. Uh, a uh, second topic, just making an enumeration shortly of, of the uh, topics, the regional competition. Middle Eastern powers are and will continue to be engaged to intense competition for influence in third countries, including a crisis area like areas like, uh, like uh, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Libya, and also some other African countries. The blocks, the political blocks that have sought to compete include the Iran-led, Iran-led radical Shiite coalition, the Turkey-Qatar Islamist-oriented alliance, and the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia's the status quo axis. And we we can also mention the uncertain outcome of. Uh, the bilateral agreements between some Sunni Arab countries and Israel, as it was mentioned before. And also the Abraham Declaration focused uh, uh, also against Iran. A third topic, which is very important to be connected to, to this discussion, is the ideological volatility. Increasing political repression in the region and the diminishing window for achieving nonviolent political change may cause populations to look toward more radical and violent ideologies. Uh, we cannot exclude the possibility that some other form of radical Islam or even some alt uh, other ideologies altogether, different radical ideological current will rise. A next topic uh, could be considered the proliferation of dangerous technologies. The unraveling of arms control agreements increases the risk of nuclear pr proliferation, but after this, uh, the largely unregulated uh, proliferation of precision-guided munitions has enabled the emergence of strategic non-nuclear threats in the, in the region. The next topic I mean, which you cannot miss, is the growing demographic pressure. His Excellency Ambassador Quack also mentioned this is not the case to enter into details. Uh, the, the title of the point express itself. Anyhow, the relatively high rate of fertility, increase in youth unemployment, and uh, children out of school, it's terribly dangerous challenges. Uh, next topic could be the societal and economic prospects. There are no indications that provide a reason to expect a significant improvement in the fundamental social economic problems of the Middle East that contributed to the political unrest in 2010 and onward. Uh, there remains a serious relative lack of human capital the public face in government institutions continues to decline, uh, and uh, the internal economic, social, and political reforms throughout the region are undercut by entrenched elites uh, uh, and ingrained practices. And also belonging to this topic, we, 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 we cannot omit to, to mention the lack of economic regional integration. The next challenge, which is typical for the whole region, is the environmental 
problem. Uh, we could discuss largely on uh, desertification, on, on uh, uh, scarcity, uh, water scarcity, uh, water in a water poor region, uh, fru f food shortages linked to this, the desertification, uh, the possible new and new refugee crisis, and possibly make some areas in the Arab Gulf un uninhabitable uh, in the coming decades. Finally, the last topic, which is interesting to mention as a separate uh, issue, is the rapid technological change. Advances in technologies such as artificial intelligence will allow for deeper incursions by authoritarian regimes into the private life of citizens. This is the digital authoritarianism and will result in more unmanned or even autonomous system on future battlefields. So summarizing all this shortly, uh, we, we, we have to reflect also on the USA's possible role in, in, the, in the region. In spite of the declared American military withdrawal from the region in favor of the future pivot in Asia, you know, uh, we have to consider the US readiness to play a strong and shaping role in the Middle East, uh, including the investment on resources, manpower, political capital to support its allies, and confront destabilizing actors. Uh, the variable is strongly correlated with the future of competition between the great powers, rivalry among regional powers, counterterrorism, nuclear proliferation, uh, uh, the, the, the role of Russia and, and China maneuvers, uh, <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, factors like Turkey and Iran and, poten and potentially uh, will allow the proliferation of nuclear and other technologies. Deeper American involvement may reign in regional struggles and diminish the probability of the appearance of a new nuclear power in the region. In the social economic basket, uh, we can mention uh, that the MENA countries are strongly correlated with, uh, as it was mentioned, the, the demographic pressure, economic prospects which are not positively uh, developing, the environmental problems, the, technolo the technological change. When looking ahead, the continued decline of energy revenues and growing populations could lead to the fracturing of existing social contracts between governments and citizens, potentially involving reduced use of incentives or subsidies and greater use of force to ensure regimes to survive. Th thank you for the moment. Thank you so much for that. I think it raised many important topics that we may return to in our discussion. Um, at this point, I think we should turn to our next discussant, um, Dr. Janos Havari. Um, he's the head of the representation office of the Cooperation Council of Turkic-speaking uh, states in Budapest, as well as a professor of the Institute of History of the Gaspar Karoli University of the Reformed Church. And I think you'll have quite a bit of, of interesting input about Turkey's role in the Middle East, and so I'm looking forward, of course, to hearing about that. No, so that we, we should talk about Turkey, but so our task at this moment, talking on the United States uh, Middle East policy, as uh, Ambassador Quack mentioned, there are the huge changes, and I'm trying to find the reasons why the United States had to restructure the, the Middle East policy. That the constructor and uh, architect of the uh, United States uh, Middle East policy in the United States is Henry Kissinger, that whose name is uh, well known, and uh, and I had to say that the Kissinger policy and vision on the Middle East failed. And by the way, so it is a time to revise the points of Henry Kissinger because he's a man who who could with his policy China to be great. The he opened the 
gates for China and uh, that the China could be the challenger of the United States of America. But uh, Kissinger was an architect of the, and the American policy was an architect uh, of the Begin Sadat uh, Camp David meeting and it started uh, the dream that the Arabs and the Israelis could have a, a new kind of new relations and uh, there were American incentives, American money, support uh, uh, for all the countries, and uh, but behind the uh, behind the lines, they were the Cold War conflict. The Cold War ended, and the fall of Berlin followed, and it started a new policy. And uh, as in Eastern Central Europe, in other places, that uh, that uh, the American policy that uh, tried to form a new world, and uh, it was valid uh, related to the Middle East, and even the Soviets in the last minute they tried to be the players. And uh, and in this in this situation, uh, that started the Madrid uh, uh, Middle East peace uh, process in uh, 1991, and uh, with the support of the United Nations, it was the last great cooperation within the Soviet Union and, uh, and the United States of America, and uh, they tried to make uh, imposed peace in the, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and, and they, it was, was a promising what was going on. But there were some players that who was not interested to have a success in Madrid. One who was not interested in, it is Yitzhak Rabin. Yitzhak Rabin was the, at the time opposition and came into power for the Israeli Labor Party and he, he, he refused as an imposed uh, peace and he started to have negotiations with the former enemy, Yasser Arafat. And Yasser Arafat was not interested in the Madrid success because he was not invited. The Palestinians, the, the, the PLO, that the Palestinian Liberation Organization, lost uh, its position in the Palestinian territories during the Intifada, that the Palestinians was able to make a new kind of civilian society, and uh, Arafat was interested. He wanted to make a special deal with Yitzhak, uh, Yitzhak Rabin. That for making it, he needed an honest broker. It was Bill Clinton and American Democrats had a dream, the great dream. That's, it is more serious dream what Kissinger ever in his life had. The making a nice word in the Middle East and to make a compromise peace agreement between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Of course, Yitzhak Rabin was committed to it, and, uh, and Arafat made tricks, and uh, they, they had a lot of advantages for this process, but to making it, that to have results, it was necessary to have the Norwegian foreign ministry, the Norwegian diplomats, Terje Rud Larsen, who later became a deputy director general of the United Nations. He was a, was a good diplomat, good negotiator, uh, with his wife, Mona uh, Yule, who is uh, the ambassador of uh, Norway to Israel. And they were working, that, that they are matching that's the, the, the Palestinians, Israel's different branches, uh, and, uh, and everything stopped when uh, when uh, Yitzhak Rami was murdered, and uh, because Rabin was a strong, strong Israeli politician who could make peace with the Palestinians, and he had a credibility in the uh, Israeli society. The murdering of Yitzhak Rabin is a disputed issue, what was behind that issue, but I think that it is the end of the Oslo process, and uh, the agony started after the assassination of, uh, of uh, Yitzhak Ramin. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton, he wanted, to, that he wanted to have his international achievement of making a peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and before ending his, uh, his term, uh, he invited a Camp David meeting. There are many reports, books about it, matching Arafat and Barak together. But it failed. Why it failed? Because there was no trust between the two sides. 
that there was no trust because of various reasons. That's because of uh, the reasons are connected to the civilization, uh, connected to the political motivations, connected to, to different issues, both sides. And there was no guarantees. Clinton failed, the new administration is coming, and, uh, and th there was no guarantees. And, uh, and, uh, and the asymmetry between Israel and the Palestinians, it was uh, obvious. And the new political figure of the Israeli politics, uh, and that's uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. He's a very experienced uh, diplomat. Uh, he's a strategist. Uh, and he was against the Oslo process. And he wanted to make a new kind of policy. He didn't want to continue the, the, the American-minded, Kissinger-minded, Bill Condon-minded, and minded policy. And he, was, he has a connection in the United States. And he tried to explain, my American friends, you should change your policy. And he was a very convincing. And uh, Netanyahu is, of course, is following uh, political motivation of the Israeli uh, politics, the Zionism, yeah, that you know that there is an assertive Zionism compared to the Theodor Herzl peaceful Zionism. It was is connected to Zev Jabotinsky, who who made his thesis in the, uh, at the end of the First World War in the 20s, and the Jews should be uh, in Palestine to be assertive, and, uh, and the struggle is a very important, the power is an important. There are many followers in the Israeli politics of Zev Jabotinsky, uh, Sharon, Begin, and of course uh, Netanyahu is uh, one of the most uh, most uh, prominent figure of the revisionist Zionism. And, uh, and uh, the United States of America could see the Arab Spring, when the MENA region started to change, the whole American policy, and during the Arab Spring failed. And the United States couldn't and didn't want to interfere because the, all the driving forces in the Arab things they were against the United States of America. And uh, what, the, what the United States could, could, uh, could do in the, in the Middle East to be a policeman, the Americans tried to be a policeman, you know, and, uh, uh, to make an order in this region, to make, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to supporting uh, different uh, military forces, intelligence forces. But why the Americans should be a policeman in the Middle East? The other issue, America, the United States of America could be a payer. It was a payer. The United States of America paid a lot of money, but why? All the policy, all the points failed, and the Middle East society didn't want to follow the American liberal democracy, the American dreams on the, on the Middle East uh, uh, the Middle East policies and the Middle East uh, uh, peace process. But the other countries in the region, besides Israel, they were very important, the United States of America. There was a parallelism in the American policy that making a peace around uh, Israel, but to have a good connection, strategic good connection with Saudi Arabia, which is going back to the, with the two world war periods, and the Gulf states, which uh, independence uh, in the 60s and policy based on the American relations, and what the Americans could do. So with the, the, how could match the pro-Israel policy with the traditional Saudi Arabia Gulf states policy. And meanwhile, the Palestinian cause that declined. Because the Oslo Accord failed, that many Palestinian forces, society groups, they lost their motivation doing anything, and the PLO lost uh, its position in the Palestinian society. Hamas emerged, the Hamas failed also, and there is a stagnation in the Palestinian uh, 
society, the police didn't want to have a new supporters. The Russian didn't want to have a great supporter. China is not interested in. The European Union started in the last 10 years a more a balanced policy towards the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict. And uh, why is important for the Palestinians Israel at this moment? It is a working place. They could work in the, in the, the, the Israeli society, the Israeli economy, needs the workers. And they could, they could have salary, they could have jobs in cooperation with Israel. Now, the future, nobody knows. And uh, there is an opportunity uh, for a national compromise in the Israeli-Palestinian um, uh, society with the, new, with the new terms, with the new conditions. I, I think that both sides should find something, sit down, and to have a, a certain peaceful coexistence. And uh, the certain, which is the tradition in the Middle East, you know, to, to, to freeze the problems and to deal with the actual pragmatic issues, the life, salary, and other issues. It was my uh, summary on the situation. And uh, it is clear that the United States uh, couldn't be, it is not an American interest, to be a policeman of the Middle East, to be a payer of the Middle East. The European Union should think about what the European Union should do in the Middle East, because it is a neighborhood, North Africa, Syria, Israel, Jordan, is more connected to the European politics than to the uh, American, Washington politics. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for that fantastic rundown of the kind of long durée of um, the peace process. Um, I, I'd like to again ask all the panelists um, if you have any brief uh, comments in response um, to Janosch's presentation. Um, otherwise, we can move on. Um, but I just thought I'd ask uh, now if there were any, any short remarks. Some short remarks. OK, please go ahead. Related to the Palestinian issue. So in general terms, it's, it's well known that since uh, uh, George Bush Sr., all American presidents were very committed and openly interested and uh, contributed enormously to deal with this problem and also to tackle, the, to resolve uh, the conflict. It was not successful as, as we could uh, follow uh, the magnificent historical overview of, of Janos Hovari. Anyhow, in spite of so much effort, and, uh, and uh, since Madrid, Oslo, Camp David, having also the roadmap, the diplomatic quartet, uh, with the Palestinian request to make the, uh, the conflict resolution guaranteed and internationally overviewed, the Israeli reaction uh, to avoid and to reject any foreign involvement, uh, the mutual reference to, to terrorism, uh, uh, and, and the unsuccess of the whole process. Nowadays, we have a kind of cold peace without agreement and even not having negotiations at all. Uh, I try to put an accent to the following issue. There is no effective pressure actually on Israel to stop the policy of unilaterally imposed measures. Israel bears quite well with international critics eventually. Uh, there is no intifada, and the occupation has created a kind of security imposed by force called self-defense, anyhow, uh, in, in an asymmetric conflict. Keeping under military control the current situation means absolute Israeli advantage in terms of time passing. A comprehensive peace agreement even would not restrict uh, uh, would only restrict and limit uh, uh, Israel's policy. Israel does not need, I mean, any binding final peace agreements. I say this also in a provocative 
uh, accent, probably we, we could have a discussion on, on this topic. Uh, if Israel is not under real pressure, the Palestinian Authority is under strong Israeli pressure to accept the American Kushner plan rejected immediately by President Abbas. Uh, it means that the, the, the Palestinian rights to have their own state is not substitute to economic investments, developments, jobs, uh, financial assistance, and, and things which could uh, take the place of, 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 of their uh, own sovereign state. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the government, in the perspective of the Israeli government, the two-state two solution as a whole is an outward idea. It has become not a political strategy or plan. It, 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 is, it is ideologically dividing the society. The right national religious wing in Israel sinks in further annexion, continuing the occupation. Uh, uh, the left is more focused on uh, peaceful coexistence uh, with the Palestinians, but as you know, in the last four recent elections in Israel, they did not want uh, more than 5%, 5-6% five, in the elections, together with their allies. Meantime, uh, about one million Jews live in Judea, Samaria, uh, 400,000 or half million, uh, from this one million altogether, uh, half of them are uh, around big Jerusalem. And since 25 years, practically rightist government are uh, governing Israel, demonizing absolutely the Palestinian Authority, mixing intentionally the Palestinian Authority with Hamas on terrorism claims. Uh, we, we, we cannot avoid also to mention that Israel considers any kind of critic in, in any sense as direct anti-Semitism. Uh, the Palestinian administration paid by foreign aid donors run not more than 40% of Cisjordania, Gaza is under blockade, total is under security control, isolation, security walls, drones, restrictions, protected settlements, uh, exclusive infrastructure and access roads, uh, and, and it, it is openly uh, made public as a position that even if there were some negotiations, it has become impossible practically to have an independent uh, uh, Palestinian state in that part of the world. As it was mentioned several times, recently a part of Sunni Arab world seems to be reconciled with establishing pragmatic bilateral diplomatic relations and even a kind of security cooperation with Israel, first of all against Iran. This is a new appreciation of necessity, overshadowing the Arab League's traditional approach focused on Palestinian suffering and not recognizing Israel. Was this a treason of the Palestinian cause or overture of a new peaceful era? Is to be seen. And also is to be seen uh, this, how the changes and the consequences uh, with the new uh, American uh, administration will develop on. Anyhow, not to forget also that there is no one word about Palestine, Palestinian rights and the two-state solution having it or rejecting it even not mentioned in the Abraham Declaration. Uh, in this part of the world, from Palestinian side, the USA is not anymore a credible neutral mediator. Let's see the Jerusalem as capital issue, the embassy's location. Uh, also, some American representatives representing the American foreign policy and and the commitment of any kind of president to resolve in a way or other the, 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 the problem were not objective neutral arbitrators. Let's think on Ambassador David Friedman or, or Jason Greenblatt or, or Jared Kushner. It, it, it's it's, it's, it's uh, without any doubt that, that they were absolutely committed and unconditionally supporting the, the, uh, the Israeli narrative. 
Uh, it was mentioned the, the, the involvement of the European Union or the lack of involvement of the Union. Uh, to be frank, the EU as an economic giant and, and political elfin at the same time restricts itself on distance critics on Israeli unilateral measures, disbursing the running cost of the Palestinian Authority and condemning the Hamas terrorism, which are, are correct from a moral point of view, but it means a, 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 a rejection of direct involvement in the middle of the, of the topic. Uh, shortly, one sentence more on the present day losing game. I just would like to, to recall your kind attention uh, on the impact of the next Palestinian legislative elections to be held on May 22nd this year. The last election uh, were held in 2006. Since then, no. Uh, uh, and in the, the last election then in 2006, as you know, uh, ended with the devitalizing Hamas victory. Prime Minister Mohammed Shtayech said recently that they can even delay or cancel again these elections if Israel does not make possible to hold the vote also in Jerusalem. This is the topic. Uh, the whole issue is full with symbolic, sensitive, uh, historical related uh, aspects. Uh, the Palestinian Prime Minister says that uh, to allow the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem to, to vote, to take part in the elections, is not a favor, but a condition fixed in previous agreements. Uh, it's very important. Today, uh, we are 28 Wednesday. Tomorrow, Thursday, 29, uh, uh, following the Israeli media, they say that uh, tomorrow morning, it will be decided if the Israelis will allow to have the, elec the, the, the elections uh, physically in Jerusalem or not. Further on, the internal crisis of President Mahmoud Abbas' deeply divided Fatah movement, even if there will be elections, can pave the way for a possible Hamas victory, or at least a coalition with them. But this scenario will cause probably a disaster effect. Uh, could the Palestinian elections previsibly, uh, pre previsible results facilitate the lasting peace and prepare the normalization toward an agreed comprehensive stability? This is a question remaining still unanswered, but to be followed with attention and positive expectation. That's our uh, 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 frame of activity. Th this is what we can do. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, before we move on um, to Dr. Jeffrey Kaplan, I know that um, Dr. Havari wants to respond briefly, and I, I'm sorry for that. Uh, Baylor and, 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 uh, and me, they were leaving for a long time in, in Israel. That, uh, so we, were, we witnessed uh, tra tragedies. We, were the, we had the life in the, with the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, of course, uh, both of us, and our friends would like to have a peace uh, around uh, olive, uh, olive months. But it is not a wish, that's, it's a dream. The realistic, the real politics means there is no intention, there is no intention enough to have a sophisticated uh, uh, compromise uh, that's in Europe and in the Euro-Atlantic world. We are accustomed to have a sophisticated agreements, binding agreements, but the Middle East is different. Traditionally, the Middle East has a life. They could arrange the problems differently. And the Western American approach, making a sophisticated Binding peace accord in this region failed. But these people who are living in the different side of the Jordan, who are living in, in this region, they have a tradition having a certain pragmatic rational coexistence. 
I remember that there was a, uh, there, there was a curfew, but there was a connection uh, uh, across the border. And actually, there is a coexistence, and I remember from Israeli Palestinian friends, before the Intifada in the 70s, the Palestinians could go to Judea and Samaria or the West Bank, and they have a, they want to, they, they, they prefer the Palestinian restaurants, and uh, Palestinians were coming, working to Netanya and, and uh, Tel Aviv and other places. I think there is a chance that there is a time to return to that kind of pragmatic coexistence. And uh, it is an illusion to waiting for a sophisticated bilateral or impulse please, because Israel is not interested in. Israel is strong. The person is weak. It could change after a few decades, 20, 30, 40 years. But actually, it is the, the peace uh, uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Unfortunately, it is a dream. Thank you very much. Well, thank you as well. Oh, yes, okay. please. So if I can uh, add a few remarks on what we, uh, what we have first, uh, first of all, uh, on the uh, uh, Palestinian and Israeli um, issue. I think, uh, first of all, um, the Hungarian diplomacy uh, doesn't believe that uh, putting uh, sovereign states uh, under pressure uh, would be a good idea. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that, uh, that um, what we witnessed in the last um, couple of decades uh, concerning uh, how the uh, West was, was uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, Israel was, was not a, not a good, uh, good approach. It didn't lead uh, anywhere. We saw uh, a different uh, method uh, by the previous US administration. And suddenly, we have uh, four uh, Arab states uh, having a reconciliation, normalization uh, with Israel. I think this is, this is the right track. This is, this is the right way. On the other hand, uh, I'm convinced that uh, there are some, some rules that, uh, that uh, all sides uh, should ex uh, ac uh, accept. It's very easy to define. These are basically the... Uh, the principles of the Middle East Quartet, uh, meaning uh, renounce violence, recognize Israel's right to existence, and so on and so forth. I think uh, we are living in a different era now. After the uh, Abraham Accords uh, have been concluded, times changed. Uh, we have uh, witnessed uh, new methods of uh, international relations uh, in the Middle East, and I think uh, we, should, uh, we should progress uh, in this way, and uh, it will uh, bring us to a new, uh, new era in the, uh, in the MENA region as well. My second remark is uh, to what uh, uh, Ambassador Jungbert uh, mentioned concerning um, uh, the dangers of uh, political Islam in the region. I think uh, nowadays, it is uh, a little bit uh, underestimated uh, in the West. I served as um, Hungary's ambassador in Egypt from uh, 28 to uh, 2020, and I have seen there uh, the uh, so-called Arab Spring. I saw there uh, two revolutions. I saw the true face of uh, political Islam in power between uh, 2012 and 2013. I can tell you that uh, this region is in a danger indeed of uh, being controlled by forces of uh, political Islam. What happened in Egypt in uh, 2013, it was like a small miracle that uh, a civil uprising that was uh, later on supported by the army managed to stop a basically fascistic regime. We cannot uh, find better words to describe what uh, the Muslim Brotherhood established uh, uh, in Egypt. But this scenario, uh, what we saw there, could uh, repeat itself in other parts of the region as well very easily, especially if we don't have uh, reconciliation, if we have uh, 
economic crisis uh, and so on. I think uh, the Western world uh, should be aware of the dangers of uh, political Islam and it should uh, put an emphasis on fighting uh, terrorism, uh, extremism and uh, all those forces uh, supporting them in a more uh, decisive way. Thank you. And thank you so much. Um, I think it's, it's the opportune moment to introduce uh, Dr. Kaplan, who's a visiting professor at Abu Dhabi University and a visiting fellow at the Danube Institute. I think he may have some remarks on Saudi Arabia, but also some of the trends that our other speakers have addressed. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to say just a few words on the Palestinian issue before going into my, into my lecture. I think what's being missed here is the cultural dynamic that is happening. When I, in the 1970s, when I first went to the Middle East, there was a passionate popular identification with the Palestinian cause. And everybody was talking about Palestine. It was what you would hear in the coffee shops. It's what you'd hear in the classroom, everywhere. And there was a real passion to it. And the flip side of that passion was a violent anti-Israel which sometimes went into anti-Jewish, but mostly anti-Israel view in popular culture. And this is from Saudi Arabia, this is from Sudan, this is from Syria, Egypt, etc. You know, just many places. But in returning 20 years later, there's been a tremendous change. And the change could not have been more extreme. To take one example in Saudi Arabia, I was working there with the security service as a teaching, um, teaching non-security things, kind of. But the very interesting thing, they are practicing self-defense. It's Krav Maga. Where did they get that from Israeli instructors? Do they talk about Palestine anymore? Never. Never. They're absolutely not interested anymore. It's been too long, and as they say, they can't govern themselves. And moreover, they can't agree amongst themselves. And if it were our issue, we would have freedom now, because we would have done it ourselves. That from the Saudis, that from the Syrians, of all people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's that change, though, has been mirrored on the Israeli side, too. In Israel, when the settlements first began after 67, with Kiryat Arba and Rabbi Levinger, the Israeli settlers were seen by the Israeli people as this kind of Wild West show. They had absolutely no social connections, no communication with the West Bank. Going back today, it's be the idea of the settlements has not only become accepted, they've become, they become part of Israeli policy. The left now accepts them. So the dynamic, is, the, the dynamic of change over the last 25 years is tremendous. I was in Hebron, Al Khalid, during Intifada I, and the hope that was all part of that violence was tremendous went back 10 years later, 12 years later, and the fury is no longer so much at the Israelis because that's, that's taken for granted. You can't drive from point A to point B without three roadblocks. So it's reduced the pa Palestine to a, a quasi-state, a quasi-settlement. But more than that, the real fury was at the Palestinian Authority because of the corruption. There's a hopelessness there. And as much as we talk about overarching diplomatic settlements and peace initiatives, I think you have to address it at that level first. Because without that, there is no peace. Simple take. This is actually a very emotional, in a way, a very personal kind of presentation because I was in Saudi Arabia in its most conservative phase from 1979 to 84, and then again under Mohammed bin Salman just a few years ago during the uh, modernization campaign. And so a lot of what I want to show you is both historical and personal. 
Saudi Arabia became independent in 1932, and it granted oil rights to the Southern California Oil Company. It never, they never did anything there because of World War II, but the joke in Saudi Arabia at the time is we will deal with the Americans and not the British because the Americans pay for what they steal and the British don't. So from then on, the policy not only in oil, but their foreign policy became very American-centered. The balance of economic power changed with the 1973 war and the oil embargo. The picture is classic because that is the, the lines at the, oil, at the oil pumps at the time. When the war began, gasoline in where I lived in America was 29.9 cents a gallon. Overnight, it became a dollar if you could find it. The oil, power, the, the oil weapon proved to be greater in the long run than the weapons of the battlefield. During the Nixon-Kissinger era, we created the twin pillar policy, which was a, our recipe, our being the United States recipe for Gulf security. The twin pillars were Saudi Arabia, with their population of 10 million, of which half are women and thus not involved in those years, and the others are too young. So it was a weak pillar on that end, and so we saw the strength of this in the Shah of Iran. That didn't work out so well either. With 1979, the Iranian Revolution changed absolutely everything, everything in the Middle East. But the echo in Saudi Arabia was powerful. It completely unrelated at the time political Islam. The Johaiman messianic or millenarian attack on the Mecca Mosque. This was a shock for the security forces because they found they couldn't do anything about it. They had to get Western help, although they needed a fatwa to allow Western soldiers to set foot on the holy grounds because it was forbidden for kafir, for non-Muslims to be there. Exception. While that was going on, though, I was living in Dammam and got to see this, the uprising, the Shiite uprising in East Province. The Shiites just happened to be living on all the oil in East Province, and they have never been accepted in the Saudi state, then or now. So integration doesn't happen, and so what you get instead is repression, and Shiite activism became Shiite radicalism, very much Iranian-sponsored. In 1979, they declared that they were going to secede from Saudi Arabia, take the oil with them, and join into a coalition with Iran. It was a crazy dream, and it got crushed in a very ugly way. By 1980, Saudi Arabia abandoned the policy of cautious reform in favor of deep conservatism. That's when I got to Saudi Arabia. And it was the time of, on the left, the Mutawa. If this were one of, my religion, one of my Islam classes, I would tell them about how all of that, how you, how you can tell a mutawa from a non-mutawa just by their dress. It's, it's quite clear here <laughs> to, to most. But the mutawa were the religious police who had real power. And they had arrest power, although they never took you to jail. They took you to their office where they would straighten out your thinking with sticks. Um, they were quite powerful, and they were completely unchecked after, 19, after 1979. It was a turn towards conservatism and towards the Wahhabi values that was seen as a kind of buffer against the kind of currents that Johaima represented. And the violence, meanwhile, in Katif continued. As the kingdom turned inward domestically, though, its reliance on U.S. support deepened. By now, the, what had become a military alliance was not only very deep, but in a very interesting way, the huge amount of resources after 1973 that flowed into Saudi Arabia and the oil producing countries began to flow back in terms of buying weapons, buying not only weapon systems, but also basing soldiers, basing trainers, and it became a very, lucrative way of getting that oil money back, although from the Saudi side, there was no way they could absorb the technology. They simply couldn't. 
And so it was not only American trainers, but the Americans were operating the systems as well, which had a very negative effect on the Saudi security structure. All right, now the big change. This was all in the, we're talking about the 1980s through the early 1990s. There was, in 2015, an earthquake there, almost of the magnitude of the Mecca Mosque takeover. And that was the death of King Abdullah, the rise of King Salman, who was selected but largely as a stopgap because he was very old, he was very ill, and he was going to hold the throne until a more powerful faction, a more powerful prince could take over. But he appointed his son, Mohammed bin Salman, as defense minister to replace Prince Naif. Prince Naif was very popular in the military and the security forces. He was also very popular with the American embassy and with the American security forces. He, he, was very, he had a very deep connections to American intelligence. So he was a very popular guy on a lot of levels, but being a popular guy on a lot of levels made him a political threat to MBS. And so he was removed from the defense ministry. Mohammed bin Salman was made defense minister, and by 2016, he had consolidated power almost completely. The first thing he did as defense minister was launch an attack on Houthi rebels in Yemen, which was a disaster from beginning to end, and it's a disaster today. What interests me as a historian about him is he's very much on the model of the strong men on horseback that we saw in the 1920s, 1930s. People like, like Ataturk, people like Reza Shah. These were very strong men, they were autocrats, but they were also deeply motivated by change, by taking in Western, Western technology, Western science, Western ways of government, and forcing them down the throats of the populace, whether they liked it or not. They were going to drag them into the 20th century, sometimes kicking and screaming, and they were very successful at it. So to me, MBS, I think in his own mind's eye, and in many ways it's very true, he sees himself as part of this tradition of strongman reformers. The reforms were many and very popular among younger Saudis. And this is something I can't stress enough in talking to the young people there and in teaching them. He is idolized by the young. And he's idolized by the young securities, security guys, the junior soldiers, the guys who are coming up, and the guys in the intelligence service who are in 20s or 30 years old. He is not idolized by the older. And there is a lot of talk in those circles that he is moving way too fast on way too many fronts, and there is going to be a reaction coming out of the villages, coming out of the towns, and coming out of the desert. So we'll see about that, but the two reforms are interesting there. On the left, he, this is exactly the time that I returned to Saudi Arabia. So I was watching all this happen with shock and amazement. The Mutawa were pulled off the streets. They were stripped of their power, and now the Mutawa is basically an old man's club, and they sit around playing backgammon, or praying, or doing whatever it is they do in their headquarters. It was, it was always a way for older guys who had no real fit in the modern economy to draw a salary and get some power and authority. Now they just draw a salary. On the right is the thing that actually shook me to the core, which is women were now being allowed to drive in very limited ways. I mean, and all the time I was there, I saw about three driving, and the men on the road were going like that. But the, the, the cartoon is very telling in a way, because how do you control as a cop, as a traffic officer, female drivers. You can't take off the hijab. You can't look under the veil, so to speak. And you can't do anything with them. You can't touch them. You can't, you shouldn't even be talking to them. 
So there was a big thing. We are going to get female officers to be traffic officers. But they can't drive. <laughs> So it's, you know, as with many reforms, there, you know, there's, there are good ideas and then the devil is in the details. Right. But like the strong men of the 1920s, MBS brooks no dissent. And the arrest of a number of members of the royal family on charges of corruption, which are not terribly untrue, and holding them in this hotel, if we had time for the video, I would show you this hotel. Oh my God, we were, I was talking to my wife there. I wish they'd arrest us and put us in this hotel. It's a five-star luxury hotel with a bowling alley, with everything you could imagine, but they don't want to be there. And to get out, they had to pay in exorbitant sums of money or exorbitant amounts of property. So it was, popular to a degree for a while. And then you talk, to guy, you talk to people in the street or you talk to security guys that I was working with, and they say, you know, hey, <laughs> this, what does this really mean? And that's when the question started to be asked, and that's when a lot of them started to be released. At the same time MBS was coming to power, with a determination not to play the game as every other Saudi leader had since King Abdulaziz, an American leader has come to power who also was equally determined not to play the game by the old rules. And they got along famously. They were very close, Saudi American relations were very close in the Trump administration on an economic level, on a military level, and on a security level. In 2018, the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi should have been or could have been a turning point in U.S.-Saudi relations. It was not. The picture on the right is, is in poor taste, perhaps, but it was also the joke that everybody, that you heard in Riyadh all the time um, from Saudis. They say MBS must stand for Mr. Bonesaw because of, the, because of how Mr. Khashoggi was killed. As a, an anecdote of the time, my students would come up to me. These are guys who are security guys who are going to go into, the, into either the security police or the Mubarak, the, the Saudi intelligence service. And they were saying, what did you think of the Khashoggi issue? As a matter of policy, I'm a career expat. And one thing you learn along the way is when you are a guest in another country, you don't criticize that government. It's very bad manners. So I would always say, well, let's talk about tradecraft. Number one, don't kill somebody in your own embassy. Number two, if you're going to do it, at least close your laptop because they're bugged. The Turkish intelligence service was filming the whole thing. And they have sound. <laughs> it, was, it was very poorly done. Um, there were pictures of this guy, as you can see, coming into the embassy and not coming out. His girlfriend is waiting for him outside because he's there to get a marriage certificate. This could not have been done worse. Could not have been done worse. So it caused a crisis in public opinion, obviously. But the Trump administration simply wasn't interested. They were going to go on with business as usual. It was no worse than the fiasco happening in Yemen. So nothing changed. But interestingly enough, when President Biden came to power on very much a platform of human rights, there was still no change. His policy and Trump's policy are almost exactly the same. And the reasons are pretty obvious. The, there are greater things at play than one man's life. There are the nuclear facilities in Iran that are in our mutual interest not to have. There is a famine in Yemen, in Yemen caused by the civil war, which is indeed caused by the Saudi invasion of 2016. There, when we were living in Riyadh, my wife absolutely loved sitting on the patio with me while we watched the missiles fly overhead. 
and be destroyed above. I thought it was like the 4th of July, but she was a little upset. Um, some of them, not all of them, were caught, and they came down in neighborhoods very close to where we lived, because we lived very much by the airport. So the web of mutual interests between Saudi Arabia and the United States has been steady. And it's one of the few steady things in the Middle East for certainly all of the history of Saudi independence from 1932 to the present. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, really fascinating presentation based, as you said, on so much of your personal experience. Um, if I might indulge my uh, power as the moderator just to briefly ask a question about um, the reforms that you've seen take place. Um, when, when we look at the history of Saudi Arabia, the other kind of great reformer, Faisal, was, of course, uh, you know, assassinated, uh, in part because of the friction and the unrest created by his reforms, which I think many people would say were extremely important in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if um, there actually is a way for MBS forward that is um, more peaceful or um, more productive, or whether he simply has to deal with the after effects and the shocks of, of the reforms, regardless of, of how he goes about doing so? Well, part of that assassination, the reforms were one thing, but it was something that took place within the royal family. And he was very much aware of that when he was arresting other members of the royal family. Um, the reforms were very cautious. They were very slow. And they didn't really affect your everyday life. The Mutawa still ruled. The women had to have a maharam, which is a male escort wherever they go. I mean, the, the reforms, so-called, were on superstructure, but they weren't felt very much on the ground. MBS is, if I were to look into the future, which historians should never do, I think he will succeed. And the reason is his popularity among the younger people is really, really strong. And the older people are, as we know, we're old. <laughs> we're not going to be there that long. But these are the people who are coming to power, and these are the, and coming into authority in business, in military, etc. And these are the guys that are going to be the basis of his rule. Women are also starting to become a factor, and they idealize him because of the reforms. So I think, I, mean, I think he will succeed in the end if he, if he survives, which is always a question in the Middle East. Thank you so much. Um, last but not least, of course, we have His Excellency Bella Jungbert. Um, he has served um, in numerous capacities across the Middle East, many of which he's mentioned. Um, but he's a former director general of the Department for Middle East Affairs at the MFA uh, here in Hungary. And so I, I thought I just might ask you to give your short presentation, um, and then we'll, we'll have a few general questions and, and discussion. So, thank you. Practically, I expressed already my views in, 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 in general terms. So uh, I, uh, I don't want to repeat the, the same topics I, I made already. So I am, I am ready to, to turn, if you agree, to begin the, the respective dialogue. Oh, of course. Yes, please. Well, I, you know, I think, um, thank you for your previous comments. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the, is the, in the news is this kind of recurring um, information about the re potential revival of the JCPOA. And I'm wondering um, what dynamic you think this will create or recreate in the Middle East, um, given you know, the context we now have of the kind of Abraham Accords and, and COVID. And um, how do you think that that, uh, that dynamic will play out? I would say uh, uh, there is a need to make a clear uh, view, clear approach uh, how the Israelis and how the Palestinians uh, think uh, to go forward uh, with living together uh, with the conflict or to have a kind of, of settlement of, of this. The Palestinians say openly that they don't think to renounce to their right to have a sovereign state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Uh, 
uh, and opposite to what Israel says, the Palestinians don't recognize Israel and, and they want absolutely the 67 borders and, and they support terrorism. So it's an artificial mixture of the Palestinian uh, authorities, leadership's view uh, with the Hamas uh, uh, demagogy and really linked to the political Islam. Uh, the, the Palestinians also say it, it was widely discussed that if the, the, the de facto fait accompli like situation which created Israel there is not anymore realistic to think in a viable Palestinian sovereign state, let's have to live together in the same one single state. If, if you want, if you don't want, uh, two nations, two states, let's have two nations, one state. Everybody living in Israel, everybody living in Cisjordania, everybody living in Gaza, everybody living in Jerusalem, East or West Jerusalem, let's live together. But it would be the end of the Zionist uh, project, having Israel as a Jewish state. Uh, uh, what, what kind of other alternatives are? In the Israeli politics, very often you find that there is no need for any Palestinian state because you do have one already. The Palestinian state is called Jordan, where the majority of the population is of Palestinian descent. Uh, not to enter into too much details, uh, Jordan will never accept this. Uh, they want, they are uh, even now linked to the two-state solution. And what Israel is emphasizing how to deal with further on with, the, with, with Jordan as a Palestinian state, they would say they, the Israelis will annex practically the absolute majority of the occupied territories with the Israeli settlements. They annexed already uh, whole, whole Jerusalem as the exclusive single one united undivisible uh, uh, Jewish capital since uh, 3,500 years it is, it is the, the slogan. Uh, and, uh, and the Palestinians will not accept a kind of su substitute state in Jordan and, and this uh, Israeli view also uh, includes the, the idea to transform uh, the Palestinian Authority, which controls nowadays about less than 40% of the territories in the Cisjordania, to minimize uh, the Palestinian autonomy to some instead of the Palestinian Authority with government and as an internationally accepted uh, category, in the United Nations area where you see Palestine, in, in Budapest you can see in the respective building uh, the, the sign of State of Palestine, embassy in Hungary, you see. Uh, uh, the Israelis suggest after the annexation of the whole Jordan Valley, after the annexation of the uh, absolute majority of the settlements created uh, legal, legally and illegally, because you have about 130 uh, Israeli Jewish settlements in, in Judea and, and Shomron in Samaria, which Israel considers as, as from Israeli point of view, and in Israeli jurisdiction, legally created, supported by the state. But you have at least 100 other settlements which are considered illegal even by the Israeli authorities uh, without having got any kind of uh, uh, permission or, or uh, uh, entitlement to create these this, uh, uh, settlements, which are not only illegally created, but through, to be frank, through ethnic cleansing, they are persecuting uh, the Palestinians there because they need territory without uh, Palestinian population. And, and 
if you envisage this kind of future Israel with Gaza to be taken under blockade or in some extreme rightist views to try to pressure Egypt to, to digest it, to accept it, to, to take it, uh, Jerusalem is over. The Cisjordania, the Jordan Valley is, is to be annexed in the future. What you have? You have some uh, Palestinian cities uh, with impossible conditions to survive there uh, collectively. But if you dislike, you are free to leave and, and to go to, the, to, to, to Jordan, to go wherever you want or whenever you can. Uh, the, the big question is that can or should the international community to accept, to accept, to follow, to digest, to, to agree with, with, with such a perspective, or uh, to keep an, a naive distance like the European Union is that they are still criticizing Israel for the human rights abuse, for the occupation, but, 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 but no, nothing else than, than this. Uh, and, and the Americans, any kind of presidency or administration, Republican or Democratic, practically what we see, unconditional support of the, the, the Israeli goals. Uh, Can I ask you about some of the cultural change that um, Dr. Kaplan raised? Um, specifically, you know, uh, under the Obama administration, we often heard the concept of the Arab street being coupled with a kind of um, desire to support Palestinians. And yet, um, when the embassy was moved to Jerusalem, the US embassy and other embassies for that matter, um, we actually didn't see kind of a collective across the Middle East um, movement among Arabs. And so has that context changed um, profoundly the peace process or has it not? You see, the, Palest the, the Arab street uh, in both, in, in Sunni or Shiite countries is, is not a representative of, of the views of, of the leadership in a way. They, they are not informed or they are manipulated. Uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, the Arab League and officially on, on head of state's level and governmental level, uh, the Arab countries, even those who signed the bilateral uh, agreements, and even those who are parts of the Abraham uh, Declaration, did not renounce to the Palestinian cause and did not express their view on not being committed anymore to the two-state solution. It can, it, it can change in the future, but, but it's a matter of, of discussion. Don't believe that, that uh, uh, the Arab countries are not any more interested in, uh, in, uh, in supporting this kind of, which is not a political question, it's more than this. It's full of its sensitiveness, with, with its collective wounds, uh, with, uh, with frustrations, uh, uh, and, and they, they also don't accept to confuse the, our international equal partner, the government in Ramallah, the leadership led by President Abbas and Prime Minister Steich, uh, don't confuse them with the political Islam and, and, and the institutionalized terror uh, which leads Gaza. The Palestinian society is not homogeneous and, and you have to see this very clearly. Right. I guess you know, another topic that we didn't get to in the individual presentations was the role of Russia. And I wonder if, Dr. Beck, you have any observations about Russia's presence in, in the Middle East these days? Or? So Russia has been playing an important uh, role in the region uh, for a long time. Russia has a long-standing uh, ties with uh, many countries uh, in the MENA region. And uh, as a partner in the international quartet, uh, I think uh, it should be taken seriously what Russia is uh, is uh, uh, talking about because uh, it can uh, contribute to the uh, uh, improvement of the situation uh, to a large uh, extent, maybe from another point of view than uh, 
the Western world, but uh, Russia has been there and Russia will stay there, so uh, we should take it uh, seriously uh, what we can uh, use, uh, how we can use this partnership uh, uh, with Russia. Thank you so much. I guess, you know, in, along the same lines, uh, we, we haven't heard much in our conversation about Turkey and Turkey's role. I wonder, um, Janos, whether you, you have any comments in that regard? Or? Uh, Turkey is a very important player in the Middle Eastern world, not only because the, you know, the parameters of Turkey, that is a population more than 80 million, is a huge country with a huge army, Turkey is an important because of the uh, because of the security policy vacuum in our or region. There are the failed states. Syria is a failed state. Iraq is a failed state. And uh, after it, uh, Turkey as a main ally of the Western world, as a member of the of NATO, Turkey in a certain in the, in a certain situation should act. Turkey didn't want to interfere into the Syrian conflict, but after the, the, that's the, the, the Syria started to be uh, a place, a ground of the international rivalry, Iranian forces, Russian forces, um, some Middle East countries' influence, Turkey should position herself, and Turkey should deal with the millions of refugees who are living at the, in southern Turkey. When I was ambassador to Turkey, I visited these refugee camps, and they were, there are in, uh, at the Syrian uh, Turkish border, there are around uh, one and a half million refugees, or maybe more. They have camps, uh, they would like to go, but they are not able to go because of the flies and the internal rivalry and inter in the, the, the in, uh, internal struggle which is going on in Syria. And uh, Turkey had to, you know, hammer out it's a certain policy. I think that the Turkish uh, presence in Syria is not only about the uh, Syrian Kurds. Syrian Kurds, they have a traditional conflict with, uh, with uh, the Turkish state. Uh, it is going back to the Soviet Union, which created a certain terrorism and a certain movement. It, it survived, there is a tradition, there are the different, uh, different positions uh, among the Kurds uh, in this region. And, uh, and I think uh, that, uh, that in northern Syria, is necessary to organize a new life, and it needs an infrastructure. Only Turkey could provide. They could provide, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, that's for the for the constructions, uh, the uh, uh, bricks and others, and and concretes and uh, and and woods and and other issues. And it is necessary to organize a life. And uh, Turkey is an uh, important player uh, in the region in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, I think it is very important a certain rapprochement and uh, the new kind of uh, the new kind of negotiations uh, between Turkey and the European Union players, what is the role of Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean? that uh, the new terms related to the custom unions between the European Union and Turkey, and this is necessary to have an open-minded dialogue with the back condition within Washington and Ankara. And uh, I hope they could see it. And uh, there was a telephone conversation uh, last week between President Biden and President Erdogan, and they will see each other at the, at the NATO summit. But it is, there are the new conditions. So we are, that's, a, that's the time of the real politics came. That is not, that is no time for illusion after the COVID and with the, 
very adventure-minded forces in the Middle East, and, and not only the Middle East, in, in other parts of the world. It is, uh, I think, so we need a certain, uh, certain wise decisions, uh, and we should turn towards the pragmatism, not to blame each other, we could blame each other. All the politicians could blame each other because of various issues. There are different perceptions of the human rights. There are the different perceptions of the economic policies. There are the different perception of COVID. There are the different perception of the role of China in the, in the future world, the role of the United States of America, the role of the uh, European Union. But the negotiation. It is a diplomacy is a very important. The politicians should sit down, and we are the preconditions, and they uh, they should be wise and uh, making our words better. It is the mutual interest, and Turkey is a partner of it. And uh, that uh, the Turkish uh, foreign minister is a very realistic man, and uh, and the advisor of uh, President Erdogan, they are a very wise person, as in the great experts are in the United States related to Turkey and many countries, and uh, um, uh, I, am, uh, I am confident that we will have a better and nicer future. Fantastic. Well, I think we're running a bit low on time. I want to thank all of our panelists again and thank the Danube Institute, of course, for hosting this, this fantastic event. Um, uh, of course, all of our viewers, thank you for joining us. Um, this has been a real pleasure. It only remains to me to add my thanks uh, to the people who participated in important and instructive discussion. Goodbye.